Thanks for uh, attending this lecture. I'm really glad to uh, introduce uh, tonight's lecture by Sarah Franceschini, which is called Morphogenesis and Generate Dynamic Landscape, Dynamical Landscape. Um, as the issue of both morphogenesis is one which was very important and very uh, present in the last 20 years of architectural debate, but also because the issue of dynamic uh, systems is becoming more and more important in everyday life, not only for architecture, but everywhere around us, for example, in the internet, traffic, uh, in various uh, physical or non-physical phenomena, like uh, traffic jams, uh, on highways, or on or all of these uh, differences, which in most of the cases imply some concept which are coming from uh, the theory of dynamical systems. So the uh, very uh, interesting thing tonight is that Sarah Franceschini will create interesting relationship between what is happening in the discipline of architecture and uh, the very scientific and sometimes mathematical and physical nature of the dynamical systems. But uh, the nice aspect is that Sarah Franceschini is a physicist. Therefore, I believe she will have a slightly different look uh, at these concepts. And most of all, she knows very precisely and intimately what dynamical systems are. So Sarah Franceschi uh, is physicist, she was trained uh, and she graduated at the University of Bologna in Italy. Then she joined Paris where she graduated uh, with a PhD in epistemology and in history of science. And she spent most of her time since then uh, in working on the relationship between precisely uh, what she calls dynamical landscapes and the concept of morphogenesis. So she went back to the early 20th century uh, theoretical biology, if I'm right, uh, and she proposed, she's proposing very interesting hypothesis about the interpretation of contemporary architecture through the glasses uh, of this uh, analysis. So, welcome, uh, Sarah. Thank you, Philippe, for this kind of introduction. Uh, I was trained as a physicist, physicist indeed, but I am working as an epistemologist, and uh, I will present today an epistemological point of view on the relation between morphogenesis and uh, dynamical systems via this uh, image of, uh, of um, uh, dynamic uh, uh, landscapes. And uh, um, I will try to instantiate this vision uh, with respect to uh, design questions. But uh, before beginning, I would like to thank also Professor Frédéric Miguerou for his invitation. I am very happy to be uh, here lecturing in this School of Architecture because, as I hope to show by my talk, I really think that there are questions that can live both in a space of um, reflection about uh, mathematics, physics, uh, theoretical biology, but uh, um, in, uh, in, um, in spaces uh, concerning um, design to a different level and scales. Um, well, so um, as an epistemologist working on dynamical systems, I am very interested in conceptual practices um, that can emerge by micro-analysis of case studies 
and uh, somehow um, I take some distances with respect um, big macro historical uh, pictures to uh, to give more attention to a way of reasoning or of making sense that one can see if uh, one looks in details to um, case study concerning particular scientific questions. As a matter of fact, I've been invited some years ago uh, to teach uh, in a school of applied art in Paris, Les Arts Deco, and uh, um, uh, to teach a, a subject called morphostructure, morphostructure, and uh, also to run a um, research program on the topic of morphogenesis and morphodynamics. And in this context, I became very interested in uh, the practices and the writings, theoretical writings, of, uh, coming from contemporary architecture. One of the first things that I discovered was uh, the, um, the, pa the um, pioneering exhibition organized by Frédéric Migarou, uh, non standard uh, architecture non standard, au Centre Pompidou. And uh, I had the chance of uh, visiting for a short period uh, the laboratory of Mark Barry uh, at RMIT in Melbourne. And at that time, I read a very known uh, um, paper by Mark Barry between surface and substance. And what I took uh, as, a, as, a, as the main idea for me uh, from this beautiful paper was uh, that one of the merits of the use of the digital media in architectural design is to enable a kind of re-engaging of mathematical thinking. And uh, of course, this mathematical thinking was, and it is still for me, at the core of uh, reasoning in morphogenesis. Since um, the tentative to imitate uh, growing or diffusion processes is one of the leading principles in the study of morphogenesis. And this can be seen also uh, a leading principle in morphogenetic design. Since one can think at processes or structures as shared properties um, by uh, mathematics, uh, by nature and by artifact. And this um, is a perspective that informed since the origin uh, research on morphogenesis. For example, the well known <coughs> Darcy Thompson, in his own growth and form, writes cell and tissue, shell and bone, leaf and flower, are so many portions of matter, and it is in obedience to the laws of physics that the particles have been moved, molded, and conformed. The problems of form are in the first instance mathematical problems, the problems of growth are essentially physical problems, and the morphologist is ipso facto a student of physical science. Well, here it is very interesting to see that Darcy Thompson um, gives a lot of importance to uh, the physical laws on the growing processes. And um, he thinks that one should not consider only the effect of natural selection. And um, other, for example, just this image uh, <laughs> by Stéphane Leduc, that in his uh, La Vie Synthétique produced this kind of uh, uh, osmotic landscapes uh, thanks to chemical uh, reactions, um, goes in this sense of being interested in physical or chemical processes that uh, can give uh, rise to um, uh, forms that are analogous of uh, living forms. 
And this perspective informed, of course, uh, the research of architects like, for example, Fry Otto, with his work on um, minimal surfaces, as you know. Um, well, in, the, in this context, I, um, I would like to ask as a question, um, what is morphogenetic in morphogenetic design? When we want to produce not a form, but the genesis of form, what is the morphogenetic principle? And the idea that I had a little bit was that from the time of Darcy Thompson, uh, or also maybe of uh, Fry Otto, some, some novelties entered the scene, both in science and in design, at least two, um, the digital media and a perspective of dynamical systems. And uh, I tried to, to work on this question through this research program inspired by a, an image coming from the history of theoretical biology, the image of epigenetic landscape, but um, uh, thought from a dynamical systems point of view. We will see what I mean. Uh, uh, before going inside um, this program, uh, just another reference, more, more recent uh, reference to the work of uh, architects uh, working uh, today in, um, in research. Well, I, I was impressed by the work of Philippe Morel, for example, his chair that uh, he uh, conceived uh, thanks to algorithm and uh, thanks uh, to um, to uh, new um, possibility of um, 3D printing could uh, make this chair exist, or uh, I know the work uh, of Aliza Andrasek uh, on this production of, uh, of a variety of morphological objects. Um, from, uh, from, from the point of view of the of the epistemological uh, reasoning on this practice, I was um, very uh, interested in this, um, in this um, statement uh, coming from a paper by Achim Menges. In computational morphogenesis, form is not defined through a sequence of drawing or modeling procedures, but generated through algorithmic rule-based process. In computational morphogenesis, the genotypic definition unfolds a performative phenotypic material systems. So the last part of the quotation you will see, it is really <coughs> in, a, in a way <laughs> could be uh, referred to the image of uh, the landscape that I will show you. So uh, we will discuss about this um, image, which is not a mathematical model. It is purely a mental image coming from the history of theoretical biology that I suggest to consider as a dynamical device of, if you prefer in French, a dispositif. So the idea is to uh, read this this image that I will show you from a structural but dynamical point of view. And the image has been introduced at the end of uh, the 1930s, beginning of the 40s, by an embryologist, Conrad Hall Waddington, who was also one of the promoters of theoretical biology. And uh, um, this image it's very important for me because, uh, for, for different reasons, as we will see, but in any case, um, René Tom, the mathematician René Tom, father of, catas of catastrophe theory, wrote in, his fa in the paper 
which can be considered the founding paper of the theory, that the image of epigenetic landscapes was for him um, a, really a source of inspiration and also a, an object uh, to work on uh, in order to develop his catastrophe theory, uh, which is a mathematical theory that comes from René Thom's research on topology and differential analysis on the problem of structural stability. We will see uh, what uh, these mean for René Thom. Uh, what I would like to say is just that for René Thom, um, morphogenesis has a very wide and general acceptation he considers morphogenesis is process that creates or destroys forms without taking into account not the nature, material or not, of uh, the substrate of the considered forms, neither the nature of the forces causing this changing. So we see uh, with respect, for example, the work of Darcy Thompson, um, who inspired also deeply René Thom, a uh, switch uh, uh, towards a, another degree of generality uh, here that I think is bound to this perspective uh, of dynamical systems. Uh, let's come to the image. This is the first image that can be, that has been proposed by Waddington in a book of 1940 organizers and genes. And the image has been, it is a painting. Waddington had a lot of friends in the artistic world of that time. And also, um, at the end of his life, uh, Waddington wrote a book, Behind Appearance, on the relations between art and science from his point of view, uh, especially during the 20s, century. He, he, in this book he wrote about a lot of, of different um, um, aspects of uh, physics or chemistry or biology of his time. He never wrote about his own work and his image of landscape that in my opinion is so adapted to create a dialogue between science and, uh, let's say, in general, creators or designers. In any case, this first image has been um, painted by uh, John Piper, and uh, the, the perspective is a little bit uh, um, difficult to understand at the first sight. Indeed, one has to read the image in this sense, uh, at, at, at the top one uh, should imagine uh, the sea for, or the ocean, for example, and, the and one uh, should see in this image a river that uh, uh, flows toward the sea, um, thanks to a kind of bifurcating um, path, to, to, to yes, a, a bifurcating um, pathways. And uh, th there is uh, this image is qualified, as I told before, as a mental image, a, represent a representation by Waddington, uh, by a diagram of the developmental system. Waddington's know perfectly that it is not more than an image, but my idea is that an image that uh, could help in thinking, if one has a visual mind, the idea is, it is my point of view as a, as a reader of this image, is that uh, yeah, this image calls uh, for a mathematization. And Tom um, um, Waddington, um, during his life, tried to, and, uh, um, to have contact with mathematicians, modelers, and he was very happy to, uh, to exchange um, ideas with René Thom, as we will see. 
Later, uh, in 1957, um, Waddington um, uses again this image, but under another form. Here, this, uh, the, the landscape, the, the hilly surface, is represented in a way that one could consider more scientific, this, this kind of undulated, undulated surface. Um, makes uh, it, it is easy to think immediately, for example, to the um, to a field in physics. A anyway, in this image, we have a ball that can uh, who is ready to roll down, and that can choose different pathways. Uh, the hilly surface represents, and Waddington writes these. Um, represent the fertilized egg. And the pathways uh, taken by the ball represent possible pathways for embryonic development. And we should uh, think to th this image uh, as working a different scale. For example, um, uh, um, at the scale of the tissue differentiation, and also at the scale of organ differentiation. Uh, I would say also uh, the, uh, another thing about uh, the um, Waddington uh, thinking. Waddington created also the term, introduced, maybe not created, but introduced this term um, epigenetics. And in the, his definition of 1942, uh, he defines epigenetics as the branch of biology which studies the causal interaction between genes and their products, which bring the phenotype into being. So we can see here really that Waddington is interested in the um, passage from genotype to phenotype, and this uh, passage is a view is seen by Waddington um, from a, um, from the point of view of the interactions between genes and also um, uh, also the products. So it is not a linear vision, but d'emblée a, a very relational vision. And uh, we can see this um, uh, translated visually, this idea, in um, a, a second image, which is uh, absolutely to consider with the other one if we want to understand the potentialities of, of Waddington epigenetic landscapes. Uh, uh, this part is the hidden part of the landscape. Um, and uh, we, we see represented uh, uh, the system of interaction between the genes modeling the epigenetic landscape. Of course, if we, uh, if we look at this image without considering the semantics, genes, uh, chemical interactions, uh, possible pathway for development, but just the structure of, the, of, of this object, we can, uh, uh, we can immediately um, appreciate some properties, uh, for example, bound to uh, the variation of tensions of the strings. One can imagine that if a, 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 a tension varies, the, the general form of the landscape change. For example, opening a new pathway for development. But on the contrary, one can also imagine that uh, thanks to a kind of compensation uh, between uh, different um, uh, guy ropes, a change in this hidden part uh, will not be transferred in the upper part. So in this case, we can imagine a kind of robustness 
that can be associated to this structure. I, I should underline that Waddington does not use the word robustness. It is a, a contemporary term. Uh, Ward, uh, Waddington uh, um, liked liked to, to create terms and to speak about its landscape, he introduced the term creot, which is indeed one pathway. Uh, he, he preferred to call uh, the pathways uh, creots and sometimes um, we creots, uh, sometimes with an uh, H sometimes without, but the idea is that it is a necessary path of development. And uh, uh, he also introduced another term to speak about this property of, uh, before I used the term robustness, but Waddington um, spoke about homeoresis. Uh, uh, I just read very quickly some part of uh, this quotation coming from Strategy of the Genes. As a matter of fact, if a process of embryonic development is disturbed, it usually returns to normality sometime before reaching the adult condition. Such, such a system exhibits a tendency towards a certain kind of equilibrium which is restored after disturbance. But this equilibrium is not centered on a static state, but rather on a direction or pathway of change. We might speak of such an equilibrium property as a condition of homeoresis, reo to flow. Uh, on the analogy with the well-known expression homeostasis, which is appropriate when it is an unchanging state which is maintained. So for Waddington, in order to speak of development, we have to think to a kind of stability, uh, which is a kind of dynamical stability, uh, not only uh, a stability toward a, um, an end uh, fixed uh, state. Um, so if we look uh, uh, at uh, these two, two parts of the metaphor, of the image uh, of the epigenetic landscape, we can speak of a kind of composite metaphor, very ambitious. Image uh, can, can say more than, uh, certainly than a mathematical model at that time, but maybe also more than written, written, a written text, uh, because uh, in, in a very synthetic manner, they point out two different aspects of development. The first one is cellular differentiation. Uh, as I said before, we can imagine both uh, tissue differentiation or organ differentiation. But what he, it is quite interesting from the point of view of a possible expression in mathematical terms of, of the image. I come just back one minute. Uh, Waddington uh, uses in his book, Strategy of the Genes, the idea of the exaggeration of initial differences um, uh, that uh, are for the ball. Uh, that could, uh, from this point of view, um, choose between different pathways be because of this property that today we could perhaps call sensibility to initial conditions. So Waddington was at that time very aware of novelty um, in, in the world of mathematics, and he was aware of this property of uh, unstable dynamical systems. And uh, there is another aspect, which is the aspect of uh, defined uh, by the notions of creod uh, and of homeoresis. Waddington uh, wrote also about canalization and buffering. 
and robustness. Uh, I put this term, but it is the contemporary term to speak about this um, idea of stability again um, uh, with respect to some perturbation but it is not a Waddington term and uh, finally as we uh, as we uh, we saw uh, the the hidden part of the image also insists on the role of interactions between the genes and their product so the the connotation of epigenetics as Waddington introduced it. Well, as a matter of fact, when uh, René Tom uh, wrote the first paper on catastrophe theory, he had a very interesting correspondence with Waddington uh, that uh, was the editor uh, of uh, the book coming from um, a symposium towards a theoretical biology that Waddington himself organized, inviting a lot of mathematicians, physicists, computer scientists, who were interested in founding a theoretical biology. And we have not the time now to analyze this correspondence, but what is emerging for, from this analysis is that there is a kind of um, mismatch between the two scientists about the use of alternative stationary states versus time extended creots and creots and morphogenetic field. Um, I, I, I think that it was clear enough the point of view of Waddington uh, on the difference between a kind of dynamic uh, stability along a pathway and uh, a stability with respect to final state. But just to, to um, go very quickly on this point, uh, on a general, um, uh, from a general point, for, from a syntactic point of view, we could say that in, uh, for Waddington, uh, in, in this image, one should think to different variables and parameters depending on the spatiotemporal scale one imagine. This is not present in uh, um, TOM models, which provide a very general description of the variations of the form. And uh, about uh, the notion of stability and robustness, um, for Waddington, there is this property of homeoresis, which is proper only to development uh, at uh, every scale. And for Tom, there is this important property that we will see, the idea of structural stability, which is for Tom, for any Tom, a property of uh, observable object living or not, that gives an access to the study of their morphogenesis. So for Tom, it is a very important property. And uh, he takes this property from the development of dynamical system theory. The idea of structural stability is the following one. If we consider a function, um, we can say that it is structurally stable if, for a small perturbation of the function, uh, the function has the same topological properties that the previous one. For Tom, um, this is an attribute of every observable um, form. And this point of view, uh, even if uh, one can criticize it from the point of view of its expression in very generalized mathematical terms, but I will not uh, speak about that here. It is uh, at the origin a very curious and uh, ambitious concept because um, developed, uh, proposed by 
Andronov and Pontryagin uh, during uh, the uh, 1913, um, because the idea is to uh, express inside a mathematical theory uh, the, uh, uh, the, the criteria to say if a mathematical model um, is good or not to represent a physical system. And the idea, qualitative idea, is the one I expressed before. Um, so we say, we see in, in Tom, I, I like to look at Tom uh, at the at least, at the, for, for what uh, I am interested here, I, I mean a dialogue between a mathematician and a biologist about the possibility of expressing in mathematical terms an image that would like to talk about processes, a process of development, in this case, what, uh, I, I like to think to Tom as someone who inserts himself in this tradition of dynamical system theory without entering in the details of his catastrophe theory. And this vocation to a dynamical system's point of view is, pr is present in Waddington writings too. For example, in Strategy of the Genes, there is this image that for uh, Waddington is a phase pace of the develop developing embryo. And what is very striking is that indeed uh, for, uh, a, a, in the case of development, phase pace is something that is growing with, with the object that uh, uh, should uh, in a sort represent this is different with respect, phase, space, in mathematics or in physics. So we are here um, really uh, looking at some, at, 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 at a dialogue uh, that presents uh, some divergences. And the differences are, for me, very interesting because they put on the table the qualitative uh, reasoning about these systems. And the development of qualitative reasoning, but in a very rigorous way, has been so important for the um, further use of dynamical system theory um, to, uh, up, um, to think to um, problems of the physical world, for example, transition to turbulence, for example, uh, um, meteorological forecasting or oscill oscillating chemical reactions, thanks uh, 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 to the to to a very uh, important paper uh, of uh, 1971 by David Ruel and Floris Takens. I will not go. I will not go into the details of this part uh, uh, of the fascinating history of chaos theory. I will, I will just take one consideration um, of David Ruel on idealization that he wrote in a paper, um, in, in a further paper. David Ruel says, in linear physics, physicists used the model of harmonic oscillator in the physics a la Landau, which was the, the way in which turbulence was thought before the contribution of Ruel and Takens, uh, physicists reason thanks to um, approximations to deal with nonlinearity. But finally, thanks to qualitative dynamics, thanks to dynamical system theory, it is possible to treat non-linearity without approximation and in a rigorous way, even if, David Ruel says, maybe the first way to do physics, linear physics, is 
more useful for practical predictions when it works. And the degree of usefulness is, um, is uh, going down <laughs> when we approach uh, uh, dynamical system theory. But we, uh, well, there is a, 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 a shift toward uh, the, possibility, the possibility of of treating rigorously these nonlinear interactions. And here I go very quickly just to say that, indeed, um, Ruel and Takens in this paper um, introduce the idea of strange attractor, that he, it is very important in chaos theory. And they can do that thanks to concept and tools that comes from dynamical system theory, in particular the idea of bifurcations and uh, an idea of genericity, which is a mathematical idea, uh, quite polysemic indeed, but uh, just to give a very, a very schematic um, idea, um, of, of the shift that these introduced, uh, th that this point of view introduced in physics, I can say that uh, we assist to this passage from the study of the properties of a given dynamical system to the study of the properties of classes of systems defined on the basis of their structural stability. And in practice, because we are interested in these practices, um, physicists tried and uh, verify, thanks to the variation of parameters in uh, numerical studies or in experiments, uh, um, tried to verify if their system was structurally stable and also they study the properties of simple generic models to uh, try and get some qualitative pictures to understand dynamic uh, behaviors. And also here I'm doing something very dangerous it, uh, that could be considered a form of anachronism, but I don't want to say that Alan Turing did the same things in his um, seminal paper of, uh, on morphogenesis of 1952. I just want to, to underline that when we look to practices, in, in, in particular case studies, sometimes we find, found similar ways of reasoning, even if they are not expressed in the same terms, uh, even if I if they don't use the same tools that sometimes are, are, do not exist. Uh, but, but we can find, a, anyway, a, a similarity of way of, of reasoning of conceptual practices. Uh, first, first thing which is quite interesting is that uh, Turing in his paper wanted to provide a model of cellular differentiation of the growing embryo. And this reference from biology was um, Waddington's work on uh, a particular concept, the concept of evocator. We don't enter in these details, but I want to say that the um, concept that Turing introduces in his paper is um, the idea of morphogenes. And Turing says, the, the word being intended to convey the idea of a form producer. And uh, he adds, it is not intended to have any exact meaning but it, seem, it is simply the kind of substance concerned in this theory. So we see here a very relational way of thinking too. And just to, just to finish this small, um, small consideration 
about the work of Turing on morphogenesis. In his paper, um, Turing um, works both on linear and nonlinear models. For linear model, uh, in a linear approximation, he can use an analytic approach. But for nonlinear models, he uses numerical calculus for a particular case study. And to speak of this case study, he uses the expression the imaginary organism. So I would say maybe one can see here that the use of the digital uh, um, tool can be associated to this uh, imagination that sometimes work on generic dynamics, even if, of course, he never used this term. Well, just to come to, to the dynamic properties of landscape, I would like to say, say that Waddington and Tom had a lot of, um, uh, wrote a lot uh, of letters about the, uh, their respective interpretations. And in a letter of December of 1970, uh, uh, 67, René Tom uh, 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 um, put these um, pictures of a plaster model that he produced thinking about a landscape. And uh, the only dynamical thing that we can see here uh, is provided by a f uh, the flow of, for example, water or a fluid that could uh, be poured from uh, um, from one uh, landscape to another. Uh, th this landscape, you will see, it is uh, more like a potential well, uh, so in this direction than, the, that, than a hilly surface, like in the Waddington case. <laughs> and uh, also, Tom, René Tom also made a, a small, a small uh, dessin uh, à la main. To, to represent his idea. And so I thought it, it could be very interesting to imagine really dynamical landscapes. And this motivated this, uh, to choose this image as a kind of, um, at the core of this research program about the dynamical properties of landscape. Uh, if a landscape is composed by maxima, minima, we can ask, uh, what is the nature of the equilibria characterizing the landscape? Which are the properties uh, of stability, of robustness? At which spat, um, spatial temporal scales we should imagine um, these um, dynamics? And, uh, and uh, uh, of what the landscape speak indeed. Um, so the idea of performative associated to this image is bound to this question. Um, the idea is to try a, and imagine um, dynamical uh, uh, devices that uh, could be some uh, could be instances of some of the dynamical properties of an, an imaginary landscape. So the point of view is to uh, take a distance from this, uh, for, for now, from each kind of semantics or interpretation uh, of the landscape to concentrate only in its Pragmatics, indeed. Um, well, uh, with this idea in mind, the the first things <laughs> that I tried to build myself was just the idea of the of a dynamics of uh, balls on a landscape. But of course, the dynamics was very very 
simple. And uh, we tried with students at Tensad and with uh, colleagues, especially my colleague Yves Mayeux, which is an architect who works on tensed membranes, to produce a dynamical device that, we, that was um, inspired uh, uh, exactly by this correspondence between Tom and Waddington. And uh, let's say if I can... Well, sometimes it doesn't work, but I will do that. Okay. Here, here we can... Yeah, we, we can see um, this, um, this device that uh, in which we see that the position of minima and maxima change in, sp in time. And also we assist to a kind of deployment of a form. And... Uh, um, And if we wait enough, we will see that the, the initial form can be uh, found again. But wo what was quite interesting for us in this experience was that immediately we saw that we, we should reason, we, we should uh, build analogies between this image of landscapes that we had in mind at and what we wanted to build. Here, for example, there are rotating bars, four rotating bars, that, and, and also two other points of control uh, that are a little bit our genetic uh, hidden system to control uh, the development of the structure. And uh, just to... Uh, just to illustrate this idea that um, working on these properties of landscapes uh, is a way to, <coughs> to open a kind of analogical reasoning. I'll show you another devices that has been uh, um, Okay. Excuse me. Okay. <laughs> no, here. Hmm? I don't know if I can open it. Let's try here, maybe. Uh, okay. It has changed a little bit. Okay, so. The, this is another, a completely different, a completely different device that, uh, that has been thought um, to, to answer the following question. What if the, what if the um, all in the landscape could interact with the rest? Of, of the landscape. For example, if the ball could interact with the, the, canaliz the um, pathway that defines the walls of the creodes. And this idea um, uh, and this, um, this experience has been proposed by two students, Maya d'Aboville and Ferdinand Dervieux, who worked with us. Um, to, to try to answer to this particular question that uh, maybe is not the first question one can see in the, in the image of Waddington, but that can be asked if we just concentrate on the dynamical potentiality of the landscape. And uh, I should, uh, maybe, uh, maybe you would like to know what uh, what are here the w w the hidden system of these of these things and we go here again 
-hmm. Here, uh, we worked with a um, um, magnetic fluid, indeed. And uh, the parameters to control the system are very simply, well, above all, um, of course, um, the gravitational field and the magnetic interaction between this magnetic fluid and some um, magnets that uh, Maya had uh, uh, around uh, his fingers, in some of his fingers, and then the mechanical pressure then he could exert on two uh, membranes that controlled this, uh, this uh, device. So here again, the, here again, the hidden genes are of a very, a very different form. Um, also, about the dynamical perspective that I tried to introduce you before, I want to say a last thing, is that here we, we tried and recognized if recurrent scenarios could present uh, um, in connection, in relation to certain kind of uh, actions on the device. This notion of scenario is very important, for example, to understand the transition to turbulence of, uh, or to other um, strange behaviors in uh, in chaos theory, and uh, it is defined as a generic sequence of bifurcations under a variation of a control parameter. And the idea was, can we find something more or less like that? Can we find that some particular action um, determines a certain kind of behavior that uh, will be followed uh, by another kind of behavior if another particular action is acted. So it is a very qualitative way to ask about uh, experiments, very simple experimental systems, questions that come from a very, uh, well, from a very technical, uh, and abstract work. And uh, for me, what it was very interesting in this work with students was a kind of, uh, of dialogue, a kind of uh, circle that I hope to be more of the kind of the virtuous circle, uh, in the sense that I proposed some, some uh, questions and the devices um, themselves um, made, us, made us think of other, a little bit more sophisticated questions, always um, uh, asked uh, thanks to analogy in a qualitative language, but it, it is a way to think um, and practice um, difficult things um, together. So I will stop here. Thank you. Well, I, well, when I showed 
were Turing intentions because he wanted to, um, uh, to write down a model for the grown embryo, but he knew perfectly that he had to limit the problem for this paper. And so uh, he wrote, uh, uh, he concentrated himself on pattern formation, spatial pattern formation. So even if he was inspired by the idea of uh, uh, the, the, the embryo as a whole, it, it just worked on pattern formation. And this uh, has been, uh, people have worked on that, uh, and it has been proven uh, that uh, one can find this kind of part of formation. But uh, for the moment, as far as I know, not for the case of all the embryos. Some form, 
let's say, partially predictable and some completely uh, chaotic. Uh, can we make a transposition between this idea and, and the structural stability on, uh, on a more mechanical level? Uh, I think uh, um, that he, um, well, you mean stability of the building, for example. Yeah, so, yeah, a building or, for example, uh, uh, I know that when we build a uh, very uh, thin uh, shape, for example, a con concrete shape, in concrete, when, I mean, the thinner they become, the less predictable they are in terms of uh, stability. So, um, I mean, can, can we explain this lack of predictability directly through this theory of uh, I, I, state, I mean, through this mathematical stability? I think no, because indeed, I like this balance between a very an extremely theoretical mind as Renan Thorne and uh, a biologist who made experiences in embryology like what you because we see really the, um, all the different, uh, the two extremes in a sense. And um, uh, for, for Tom, uh, he, al he always hold this property as very important. To him, we could observe things only thanks to this property. But from a pure mathematical point of view, uh, theorems have been developed during the, um, the 50s. So before the development of catastrophe theory and come new then, that limited the possibility of uh, classifying all the systems in terms of the property of their stability go um, in a dimension uh, bigger than two. So, but Tom knew that. Anyway, I want to say one question. This question is extremely interesting because uh, reasons of structural stability are used in the later in a lot of the theoretical paper, for example, in the paper of Tens of Well, and a lot of works of physicists that work on chaos. And what is very interesting, in my opinion, is that in many cases, through different uh, strategies or tools, like for example, Poincaré sessions, they put them, themselves in the situation of prisoning in two or one dimension. So in very simple cases, and in this, in these very simple cases, considerations of structural stability hold. So it is a very, uh, it is very a, a very fine tuning on the good situation to find the way of reason. It is not something uh, a kind of package that you have that uh, work. Once what is done, the performer mathematician? No, yeah. and he writes. And he writes himself, I don't know a lot about mathematics, and Ren Tom, when he, because this correspondence has been published, uh, um, uh, Ren Tom published in, in a kind of collection of, uh, of works in which there is his first uh, founding paper. And Ren Tom interprets this dialogue as a difference in the mathematical cultures. He says, we don't understand each other. Because if Waddington understood me, he, he would, uh, he would uh, <coughs> agree with me that his property of homeoresis, it is just the property that a system which is structurally stable has going towards its attractor. This is Tom interpretation. And, and Waddington has no difficulties in admitting that his culture in mathematics is not developed enough. But I think that it is not the only reason. Because I think that indeed there are theoretical questions that, that are open by this misunderstanding. It is not just a question of language. 
And also, I have to say about Waddington that Waddington was not a mathematician himself, but uh, promoted a lot work of other mathematicians, for example, Brian Goodwin, the, uh, the prepared the postdoc in Edinburgh on, uh, on theoretical biology, and also another, uh, another um, uh, student. Uh, Edward Caxel that worked on metabolic networks under the impulse of Waddington. So Waddington understood perfectly the importance of nonlinear equations. And also, I didn't say this, but Waddington was a reader of cybernetics. And the chapter in which he introduces this image, uh, the title is A Cybernetic of Development. And he says, I don't know. What is, after all, this epigenetic machine? He uses the term machine. Uh, well, I think that I like this image because there are a lot of I don't know around, <laughs> around it. <laughs> 